Hello, everybody. Today, I'll be speaking with Richard Mull. Richard is a researcher at OpenAI, where he works on AI governance and forecasting. He also was a research engineer at DeepMind and designed a course, AI Safety Fundamentals. We'll be discussing his report, AGI Safety from First Principles, as well as his debate with Eliezer Yudkowsky about the difficulty of AI alignment. For links to what we're discussing, you can check the description of this episode, and you can read the transcripts at axrp.net. Well, Richard, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. You write this report, AGI Safety from First Principles. What is AGI? What do you mean by that term? Yeah, so fundamentally, it's AI that can perform as well as humans or comparably to humans on a wide range of tasks because it's got this thing called general intelligence that humans also have. And I think this is not a very precise definition, I think, because we just don't understand what general intelligence really is, like how to you know, specifically pin down this concept. But it does seem like there's something special about humans that allows us to do all the things we do. And that's the thing that we expect AGI to have. And so I shouldn't be imagining that there's like some really technical definition of general or intelligence that you're using here? No, I think it's much more like a pointer to a, let's say, pre-paradigmatic concept that we, you know, we, we kind of know the shape of it, but we don't understand in mechanistic detail how general intelligence works. It's got these components like, you know, of course you need memory, of course you need some kind of planning, but like exactly how to characterize the ways in which you know, which combinations of these count as general intelligence is something we're not at yet. So when when you're talking about AGI, often there's this idea of AGI that's smarter than people, um, which implies that intelligence is some kind of scalar concept where you can have like more or less of it. And like, it's really significant whether you have more or less of it. Do you think that's basically a correct way to think about intelligence? Or should we just not go with that? Yeah, I think that seems like a good first approximation. Uh, You know, there's this great uh, parody paper, I think it's called On the Impossibility of Supersized Machines, which says, you know, size is not a clear concept. Like, you know, there are different Mm. dimensions of size, like height and weight and width and so on. Um, So, you know, there's no uh, single criterion of when you count something as bigger than something else. But nevertheless, it does make sense to talk about machines that are bigger than humans. And so in Roughly the same way, I think it makes sense to talk about machines that are more intelligent than humans. And this is kind of, I'd characterize it as something which draws from a sort of long intellectual history of realizing that humans were like a little bit less special than we used to think that, you know, we're not in the center of the universe. We're not, uh, you know, that different from other animals. And now uh, that we aren't at the pinnacle of intelligence. Okay. Um, Why should we think of intelligence as this kind of scalar thing? One way you can do it is you can uh, hope that we'll come up with a sort of more precise theory of intelligence. You know, in the same way, I, I like the some metaphors from the past. So when we think about the concept of energy or when we think about the concept of information or even the concept of computing, mm-hmm. these were all things that were like, you know, very important abstractions for making sense of the past. Like you can think about the industrial revolution as, you know, this massive increase in our ability to harness energy. Even though at the time the industrial revolution started, we didn't really have a precise concept of energy. So one one hope is to say, well, look, uh, we're going to get a more precise concept as time goes by, just as we did for energy and computation and information. Mm. And, uh, you know, whatever this precise concept is going to be, uh, we'll end up thinking that you can have more or less of it. Probably the more robust intuition here is just like, it sure seems that if you make things faster, if you uh, make brains bigger, um, they just get better at doing a bunch of stuff. And, uh, you know, it seems like that broad direction is the dimension that I want to talk about. Okay. Um, So that's intelligence. I guess we're also talking about general intelligence, um, Mm -hmm. which I think you contrast with narrow intelligence, where uh, if I recall correctly, a narrow intelligence is something that can kind of do one specific task, but a general intelligence is something that can, you know, do a wide variety of tasks. Is that approximately right? Yeah, that seems right. Um, I think there are a couple of different uh, angles on uh, general intelligence. So uh, one one angle that uh, is often taken is just thinking about, uh, you know, like being able to deal with a wide range of environments. And that's kind of uh, an easy thing to focus on because it's very... Uh, you can very clearly imagine having a wide range of different tasks. 
Another take on generality you might have is that generality requires the ability to be very efficient in learning. So you mm. know, only um, you know being able to pick up a new task with only a couple of different uh, demonstrations. Uh, and an another one you might have is that generality requires um, the ability to act coherently over long periods of time. So you can you know you don't have to um, you can carry out tasks on timeframes, not just of hours, but on days or weeks or months or so on. I think these, these all kind of like tie together because fundamentally when, when you're doing something in a narrow domain, you can memorize a bunch of heuristics. So you can encode all the information within mm. uh, the system that you're using, uh, like the weights of a neural network. Whereas when you've got either like long time horizons or a wide, wide range of environments or not very much data, like what that means is you need something which leverages uh, uh, which isn't just memorized, which is, uh, in some sense, um, able to get more out of less. Okay, cool. And I, I guess we're going to take it as sort of given for this discussion that we should expect to get AGI at some point. Um, for people who are wondering, who are perhaps doubtful about that, um, can you give people a sense of why you think that might be possible? Yeah, so I think there are a couple of core intuitions which seem valuable. So the first one is that um, there are a lot of disanalogies between neural networks and human brains, but there are also a lot of analogies. And so to me, it seems overconfident to think that scaling up neural networks with presumably a bunch of algorithmic improvements and architectural improvements and so on. Um, but once you're using as much compute, either as, you know, an individual human brain or maybe as all human brains combined, or maybe as like, you know, the entire history of humanity, which are all milestones that are like feasible over a period of decades. Hmm. Um, at that point, uh, it seems like you really need some sort of specific reason to think that neural networks are going to be much worse or much less efficient than human brains in order to not place a significant credence on those systems being general uh, or with a capability of generality in the same way as humans. Another intuition here is that um, you know, a lot of people think about machine learning as a series of paradigm shifts. So we started off with symbolic AI, and then we moved into sort of more like statistical style machine learning, and now we're in the era mm. of deep learning. And I think this is a little misleading. I think uh, the way I prefer to think of it is that neural networks were just plugging along, doing their thing the whole time. Like, you know, the perceptron and the first um, models of neurons were around before, you know, people think of the field of AI as having officially started. And so uh, if you just like look at this trend of neural networks getting more and more powerful as you throw more and more compute at them and as you make relatively few uh, big algorithmic changes, then it starts to seem more plausible that actually you don't need a big paradigm shift in order to reach AGI. You can just keep scaling things up because that actually has worked for the last you know 70 years or so. Okay. So it seems like your case is really based on this idea of, of like, we're going to have modern machine learning or deep learning, and we're going to scale it up. Mm. You know, we're going to scale it up in some ways. Maybe we're going to make discrete changes in like algorithms or architectures in other ways. In this process of scaling, what similarities do you see as going to be retained from now until AGI? And what important differences do you think there are going to be? Yeah, so I think the core similarity, um, you know, neural networks seem like they're here to stay. Reinforcement learning seems like it's here to stay. Um, Self-supervised learning seems pretty fundamental as well. So these all feel very solid. Um, then I think you know the, the fundamental question is something like, how much structure do you need to build in to your algorithms versus how much structure can you kind of like meta learn or learn via architecture search or things like that? Um, and you know that, that feels like a very open question to me. Uh, it seems like, in, in some cases, we have these like very um, useful algorithms like um, Monte Carlo tree search. Mm. And if you, can, if you can, can build that into your system, then wh why wouldn't you do that? Uh, and it seems really hard to you know, learn so something like um, MCTS. And MCTS is just sort of randomly kind of looking at, okay, if I take various sequences of actions, you know, how well is that likely to be? And I sort of randomly you know, maybe I randomly pick actions or pick actions that I think are more likely to be optimal, that kind of thing. Right, exactly. But then you might think, uh, look, it's just hard to um, 
so so yeah you've got these kind of different imp impulses on one hand we've got a few uh, algorithms or a few like ways of designing networks that seem very clever and like maybe we can come up with more clever things on the yeah. other hand uh the sort of idea of the bitter lesson from rich sutton which is just that uh most clever innovations don't really last um and yeah so i i feel very uncertain about how much algorithmic progress you need in order to continue scaling up ai okay so a question I have sort of along this front, current AI systems at least seem like a lot of what they're doing is recognizing patterns mm -hmm. in a sort of shallow way. And maybe um, when you have a neural network and you want to get it into a new domain, you need to expose it to the new patterns until it can like pick up the new patterns um, and maybe it draws something on what the old patterns were like. But it's, it seems at least to a lot of people to be very pattern based. Um, and some people have this intuition that um, something more like reasoning uh, is going to be needed, where within the neural network, it's just like, you know, understanding its environment and doing kind of these things like MCTS playouts, you know, inside its head. And that once you have this kind of thing, you won't need to be exposed to that many patterns until you just like understand the nature of what's going on. So I'm wondering, like, to what degree does this difference between pattern recognition versus like real reasoning play in your thinking? And do you think that real reasoning is necessary and slash or do you think that we'll get it in things roughly like current neural networks? Um, I think that, yeah, uh, what you call real reasoning is definitely necessary for AGI. Um, having said that, I think pattern recognition is maybe more fundamental than a lot of people give it credit for where when humans are thinking about very high level concepts, we do just use a bunch of pattern recognition. Like when you think mm. about, I guess, uh, great scientists thinking in terms of metaphors or like intuitions from a range of different fields, um, you know, Einstein imagining thought experiments and so on, mathematicians, uh, you know, visualizing numbers in terms of like objects and, mm. you know, the interactions between those objects. Like these all feel like types of um, pattern recognition I'm kind of like gesturing towards the idea of this book by uh, Lakoff called Metaphors to Live By, which is you know mm. basically arguing that just a huge amount of uh, human cognition happens via these types of drawing connections between different domains. Now, of course, you need uh, some type of explicit reasoning on top of that, but uh, it doesn't seem like a fundamentally, it doesn't seem like the type of thing which uh, necessarily requires new architectures or um, you know us to build it in explicitly. There's, there's another book which is uh, great on this topic called The Enigma of Reason, which is um, kind of like fits these ideas together, like uh, explicit reasoning and pattern matching, and basically argues that you know explicit reasoning is just a certain type of pattern matching. It's the ability to uh, match uh, patterns that have the right type of justification. Hmm. Um, uh, I'm not doing it credit here, so uh, you should, you should ch check that out if you're interested, but... Uh, Basically, I, I think that these two things are pretty closely related and there's not like some fundamental difference. Okay. So moving on a bit, in the report, you talk about different ways AGIs could be. Um, one of them is sort of, you know, you have this like single neural network maybe that's an AGI, which mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people are more familiar with. And then you, you also talk about um, collective AGIs that are maybe composed, maybe it's an AGI civilization where the civilization is intelligent or mm -hmm. something like that. Could you describe those and tell us like how how important are those to think about if people don't normally think about them? Yeah. So I guess the core intuition behind thinking about a single AGI is just that our training procedures work really well when you train end to end. You take a system, you give it a feedback signal, and you just adjust the whole system in response to that feedback signal. Hmm. And you know what you get out of it is basically one system where all the parts have been shaped to work together by gradient descent. So that's a reason for thinking that, you know, uh, in terms of efficiency, having one system is going to be much more efficient than, you know, having many different uh, systems trying to work together. Um, I think the core intuition for thinking about a collection of AGIs is just that it's very cheap to copy um, a model after you've learned it. And so if you are thinking about, if you're trying to think about the effects that a single, like building a single AGI will have, it seems like the obvious next step is, 
is to say, well, you know, you're going to end up with a bunch of copies of that because it's very cheap. And then now mm. you're going to have to reason about the interactions between all of those different systems. I think that it probably doesn't make a huge difference in terms of thinking about the alignment problem because, you know, I don't think you're going to get that much safety from having a large collection of AGIs compared to just having one AGI. It feels like if, if the first one is aligned, then the others are going to, uh, then the collection of many copies of it is going to be as well. Hmm. Uh, and if it's not, then they won't. But it does seem pretty relevant to thinking about the dynamics of how AGI deployment might go in the world. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And I guess one question I have related to this, like, like that sort of points to this idea that um, instead of thinking just about each AGI or, you know, each neural network or whatever being intelligent, we should, we should also think of the intelligence of the whole group. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, so I have this colleague, Dylan hadfield Manel, who's very interested in this idea that like, when we're thinking of training human AI systems, um, well, when we're thinking of tra training AIs to do things that people want, we should sort of think about like having a human AI system be rational in the sense of like conserving resources and like achieving that that whole system should achieve the human goal. So I'm I'm wondering like um, yeah, what, what thoughts do you have about whether like kind of the locus of intelligence we should think of that as being single AI systems, multitudes of AI systems, or some combination of humans and AIs? I think that the best outcome is to have the locus of intelligence effectively being some combination of humans and AIs. Um, to me, that feels like more of a governance decision rather than an alignment decision, uh, in the sense that I expect that increasingly as we build the AGIs, they're going to take on more and more of the uh, cognitive load of whatever task we want them to do. And so if there's some point where we're going to stop and say like, no, we're not going to, um, yeah, we're going to try and prevent the AGIs from assuming too much uh, control, then I hmm. think fundamentally that, that's got to be some sort of regulatory or governmental choice. Uh, I don't think it's the type of thing that you'd be able to, build in on a technical level is my guess and then when it comes to uh when it comes to many agis you know i think pe people do underrate the importance of it, in particular uh, cultural evolution when it comes to humans where that's mm. one way in which the locus of um intelligence is uh not in a single person it's kind of like spread around uh many people uh, yeah, so, so that, that's some reason to suggest that the like emergent dynamics of, um, of having many AGIs will play an important role. But, you know, I think most of the problem comes in talking about a single system. And like, if you can have guarantees about what a single system will do, then you can work from there to, to talk about the, the multi-agent system. But basically, I think the claim is that having the multi-agent system makes things harder, but uh, we shouldn't, some people have argued that it kind of makes things easier, that it means we don't need to worry about, um, you know, the alignment problem for a single agent case. And I think that, I think that's incorrect. I think, uh, you know, start, start off by uh, solving it for the single agent case and then uh, without relying on any sort of messy multi-agent dynamics to make things uh, go well. So we've, we've sort of uh, hinted at this idea of an alignment problem or at various risks. Mm -hmm. um, something that people might want to know is like, so some people seem to think that if we had AGI, this would be a really big deal. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that's right? And if so, why? Yeah, um, I think that's right. I think, you know, there, there, there's the sort of uh, straightforward argument, which is humans can do incredible things because of our intelligence. Um, if you have AGIs, then uh, they'll be able to do uh, incredible things either much faster or, or in a way that builds on themselves. Um, and this will lead to the types of scientific and technological advancement that we can't really even imagine right now. Um, maybe maybe as, as one uh, thought experiment I particularly like, uh, imagine, you know, taking uh, 10,000 scientists, like 10,000 of the best scientists um, and technologists 
and just accelerating them by a factor of like a thousand, just like speeding speeding up the, the way they can think, um, speeding up the types of progress that they make, and uh, speeding up, I guess, their computers that they're working on as well. Um, and like, what could they do after, um, you know, the equivalent of 500 or a thousand years? Uh, well, you know, they, they would have some disadvantages, right? They wouldn't be able to um, engage with the external world nearly as easily. But I think if you just look back uh, 500 years ago and you think like, like how far have we come in 500 years through this process of scientific and technological advancement, uh, it feels like it's kind of wild to think about anywhere near the same amount of progress happening um, over a period of uh, years or decades. Um, so that's yeah, what one intuition that I find particularly compelling. Okay, seems like a pretty big deal. Uh, when do you think we'll get AGI, and why do you think it'll take that long? Yeah, so I don't have particularly strong views on this. So to a significant extent, I defer to um, the report put out by Ajay Kotra at Open Philanthropy, which, uh, if I recall correctly, has a median time of around 2045 or 2050. I think that report is a pretty solid baseline. Uh, you know, I don't think we should have particularly narrow uh, credences around that point in time. Um, I guess it feels like there are some arguments, some like high-level arguments that sway me, but that ultimately kind of cancel out. So one high-level argument is just, look, um, there are a lot of cases in the past where um, where people were wrong about, uh, were like wildly overconfident about a technology needing to take a long time. So, you know, the classic examples being um, predictions of uh, the Wright brothers about how long they'd um, take to build an airplane where they thought it was 50 years away, I think, you know, two years before they built it. Um, okay. You know, uh, predictions by, uh, I think it was, you know, about like landing people on the moon, uh, I think Lord Kelvin thinking that the nuclear reaction was kind of uh, moonshine and nonsense, and that was only a few years before, uh, or maybe even after they'd uh, made the most critical breakthroughs. So, you know, mm. all of these, they, they feel like strong intuitions uh, that, that like kind of weigh in the direction of not ruling out uh, significantly earlier timelines. On the other hand, uh, these do feel a little bit cherry-picked and it feels like there's a lot of, um, you know, there, there are many other examples where people just like see one plausible path to getting to a point and just don't see the obstacles that are going to slow them down a lot because, uh, because the obstacles are just not as salient, you know. So uh, probably people 50 years ago were wildly overconfident about how far rocket technology and nuclear power would get. And th these are, you know, pretty big, deals um you know it would uh it would be very significant if we could, could do like asteroid mining right now or if we had like very cheap nuclear power but mm. um there were just like a whole bunch of unexpected obstacles even after the sort of initial early breakthrough so you know th these i think these intuitions kind of like weigh against each other and the main effect is just to make me pretty uncertain all right cool and a related question that people have so there's some sense of like well if it's some people think that we might need to make preparations before we get agi mm -hmm. And if AGI will come very suddenly, um, then we should probably do it now. But if it'll be like very gradual and we'll get a lot of warning, maybe we can wait until AGI is going to come soonish to prepare to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, so just on the question of how sudden AGI might be, do you think that it's likely to sort of happen kind of all at once without much warning? Or do you think that there's going to be this very obvious gradual ramp up? I think there's going to be a noticeable and significant ramp up. Whether that ramp up uh, takes more than a couple of years is hard to say. So, so I, I guess that the most relevant question here is something like, how fast does the ramp up compared with the ability of say the field of machine learning to build consensus and change direction hmm. versus how, how fast does it compared with the ability of uh, you know, world governments to um, notice it and make appropriate actions and things like that. Uh, and, you know, while I'm pretty uncertain about how long the ramp up might take, uh, it feels like pretty plausible that it's uh, shorter than uh, the other compa comparable ramp ups that I just mentioned. 
And, and so that, that feels like the decision relevant thing. If the world could pivot in a day or two to really taking a big threat seriously or really taking a uh, technological breakthrough seriously, then hmm. um, that would be a different matter. But as it is, you know, how, how long does it take for, for the world to pivot towards taking global warming seriously, like a matter of decades, um, even coronavirus, it took, you know, months or years to really um, shift people's thinking about that. So that's kind of the, the way I think about it. There's no real expectation that uh, people will react in anywhere near a um, rapid enough way to deal with this All unless right. we start preparing in advance. Cool. And another question I have just in terms of what it might look like to get AGI. There are two scenarios that people talk about. So one scenario is sort of related to the idea of collective AGIs and stuff. Mm -hmm. There's there's one strain of thought which says probably what will happen is around the time that we get AGI, probably like a bunch of research groups will figure it out at approximately the same time interval. And we should imagine a world where there are tons of AGI systems. Um, you know, maybe they're competing with each other, maybe maybe not, but you know, there are a bunch of them and we have to think about a bunch of them. Um, there's some people you think, look, probably it's one of these things where either you have it or you don't to a pretty big extent. And therefore there's going to be a significant period of time where there's just going to be one, uh, AGI that's like way more relevant than any other intelligent system. Which of these scenarios do you think is more likely? I don't think it's particularly discreet. So I don't think you've either got it or you've not. I think that the scenario that feels most likely to me um, although, again, with pretty wide error bars, is that you have the gradual deployment of systems that are increasingly competent on some of the axes that I mentioned before. So in particular, like being able to act competently over longer time horizons hmm. and uh, being able to act competently in new domains with fewer and fewer samples um, or less and less data. Um, and so I expect to see systems rolled out that can, you know, do a wide range of tasks better than humans over a period of five minutes or a period of an hour or um, possibly even over a period of a day um, before you have systems that can uh, do the sort of strategically uh, vital tasks that take, you know, six months or a year, things like, you know, long term research or uh, or starting a new company or, you know, making these um, large scale strategic decisions. And then I, I expect there to be the sort of push towards increasingly autonomous, uh, increasingly efficient systems. But then once uh, we've we've got those systems starting to roll out, I guess I think of it in terms of orders of magnitude. So the difference between you know being able to act competently over a day versus being able to act competently over a week versus uh, six months or so is we should expect that going from a week to a couple of months is not much harder than going from a day to a week. Uh, you know, it, each, each time you sort of jump up an order of magnitude, it feels like that's roughly speaking, uh, we should expect it to be a similar level of difficulty. Okay. So does that look like a world where um, there, there's this whole field, you know, one person out of the field managed to figure out how they're, to get their AI to plan on the scale of a year and the rest of them figured out how to have their AIs plan on the scale of like a month or two and... Um, maybe maybe the one that um, can plan on the scale of a year is just like way more relevant to the world than the rest of them. Yeah, that seems right. Okay, cool. So we've mentioned this idea that like maybe, well, your report is titled AGI Safety from First Principles, and mm -hmm. we've talked a bit about the things like the problem of alignment. How good or bad should we expect AGI to be in terms of uh, its impact on the world and what we care about? Yeah, so it feels like the overall effect is going to be dominated by the possibility of these extreme risk scenarios to me. Uh, it feels like, yeah, a very, it's hard to know what, uh, uh, what's going on in expectation because you have these like, you know, mm. very positive outcomes where we've, um, you know, solved scarcity and like understand how to build societies in much better ways than we currently do uh, and can kind of like make a brilliant future for humanity and then also the ones where uh, we've ended up with uh, catastrophic outcomes because uh, we've built misaligned AGIs. So yeah, hard to, hard to say on balance what it is, but it feels like a, a point in time where you can have a big influence by like trying to swing it in the positive direction. Okay. So, so why think that, it seems like you think there's a good chance that we're going to 
build AGI that um like do, like does it kill everyone? Does it enslave everyone? Or does it make everyone's lives ten percent worse? Like yeah, I think um probably the way I would phrase it is that the AGI gains power over everyone and uh, power in the sense of just like being able to decide how the world goes. And then, you know, at that point in time, it feels pretty hard for me to say exactly what happens after that. But it feels like by the time we've reached that point, we've screwed up. And like, when I say like having power, what I mean is like having power in a way that doesn't, you know, defer that power back to humans. Um, okay. Yeah. And what do you think, like, uh, how, how afraid of that should we be? Because I guess there's some world where what that looks like is, um, you know, maybe I should imagine that we, we have something like the normal economy, except everyone pays like, you know, 50% of their income to the AGI overlords or something. And it, mm-hmm. the AGI gets to, you know, colonize a whole bunch of stuff and it buys a whole bunch of our labor. Like, mm-hmm. uh, is it something, should we be like super afraid of that or? Yeah, I think um, we should be. Uh, pretty afraid in like a pretty comparable way to how if you describe to gorillas humans taking over the world um Hmm. they should be pretty afraid now it's true that like there's some chance that you know the gorillas get a happy outcome like maybe we're particularly altruistic and we you know are kind to the gorillas I, i don't think there was any you know strong reason in advance to expect that humans would be kind to gorillas and in fact you know there have been many cases throughout history of, you know, humans driving other species to extinction just because we had power over them and we could. So broadly speaking, a system that chooses or like a set of systems that choose to gain power over humans, even just from that fact, we can probably infer that uh, we should be pretty scared. Okay. So the thing about AGI is that it's, it seems like it's probably going to think that people make, or at least people make the things that make it or whatever. Why? There's some sort of argument which says, look, probably AGI won't, we, like, we won't build, like, really terrible AGI systems that take over the world, because if it seems like, if, if anyone, you know, foresees that, they won't do it because they don't want the world to be taken over. I'm wondering what you think of this argument for, you know, things will be fine, because we just won't do it. Yeah, so I think, in some sense, the core problem is that we don't understand what we're doing when we build these systems to anywhere near the same level as we understand what we're doing when we build an airplane or when we build a rocket or something like that. So yeah, in, in some sense, if you, if you step out and you're like, why is AI different from other technologies? One answer is just like, we don't have a you know scientific principled understanding of how to build AI. Uh, whereas, you know, for a lot of these other technologies, we do. Now, we could say, well, you know, let's experiment until we uh, until we get that. And then I think the answer to that would just be, uh, if you really expect AGI to be such a powerful technology, then you might just not have that long to experiment. Like maybe, you know, maybe you have a, uh, months or years, uh, but like that's not really very long in the grand scheme of things when you're trying to figure out how to make a system safe. And in particular, a type of technology that's like very new and very powerful. Uh, it feels like yeah, if if we if we really knew what we were doing uh, in terms of like us designing the systems, then I feel much better. But as it is, it's more like our optimizers, our training algorithms are the ones designing the systems, and we're just kind of like setting it up and then uh, letting it letting it run a lot of the time. Okay, but why why should we expect people to like like, like it seems like in this story, there's still some point where somebody says, "Look, I'm going to set up this system, and it's." going to there's a really good chance it's going to turn into an agi and i don't really understand agis Mm -hmm. and there are these you know good arguments that i've heard on this podcast that i listen to for how they're going to be Mm -hmm. powerful and they're going to be dangerous but i'm going to press the button anyway uh why why do they press the button isn't that irrational so one answer is just that uh they don't really believe the arguments right and i think it's easy to not believe the arguments when uh the thing you're postulating is this like qualitatively different behavior from the other systems that have come before. Uh, Jacob Steinhardt has an excellent series of blog posts recently talking about sort of emergent changes in behavior as you scale up AI systems. And I think it's kind of like, it does seem a, um, a little bit crazy that as you just like make the systems more and more powerful, you're not like really changing the fundamental algorithms or so on. You do get these, uh, 
you know, fundamental shifts in what they're able to do. So not just, you know, performing well in a narrow domain, but then performing well in, in like a wide range of domains. Uh, and then, you know, maybe a, the best example so far is GPT-3 being able to do few shot learning just by being given prompts. Like that's the sort of thing. And, and that's like, you know, much smaller than the types of change you expect as you scale systems up from current AIs to AGIs. So yeah, plausibly people just don't intuitively believe the scale of the change that they'll expect to see. Uh, and then the second argument is, you know, maybe they do, but um, there are a bunch of competitive motivations that they have. You know, maybe uh, they're worried about economic competition. Maybe they're worried about geopolitical competition. Uh, you know, it seems pretty hard to talk about these very large scale things decades in advance, but th that's the sort of fundamental shape of an argument that I think is pretty compelling. Like, you know, if people are worried about getting to a powerful technology first, then they're going to cut corners. Okay. So now I'd like to talk, I guess, a bit about the technical conversation about making these AGI systems safe. So uh, you've recently had this um, conversation with Eliezer Yudkowsky, um, this an early proponent of the idea that there, that there might be uh, existential risk from AGI. Mm -hmm. And one thing that came up is this idea of, um, of goal-seeking or, or goal-directed agents, where I think... Eliezer had this uh, point of view that was very, very, very focused on this idea that we're going to get these AI systems that they're going to have very coherent behavior in pursuit. Mm -hmm. Well, that they will sort of coherently shape the world in a certain way, mm -hmm. and that's kind of how he thinks of. Um, he, he kind of thinks that there's just one natural way to coherently shape the world for simple goals, and it seems like in your point of view, you think about these uh, abilities of agents like self-awareness, uh, ability and tendency to plan. Um, picking actions based on their consequences, uh, how mm -hmm. sensitive they are to scale, how coherent they are, and how flexible they are. Mm -hmm. And in your view, it, it, it seems like you sort of think about agents as sort of sliders on these fronts. Maybe we'll yeah. have a low value of one, on one of the sliders. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about, I guess, the relationship between these ways of thinking and where you would rely on one versus the other. So I think the first thing to flag here is that Eliezer and I agree to a much greater extent than you might expect from just reading the debate that we had. So I think he's, yeah, this core idea that he has that um, there's something, you know, fundamentally dangerous about intelligence uh, is something that I buy into. Um, I think the the particular things that I want to flag on that front are this idea of instrumental reasoning, the idea that, you know, in order to, you know, achieve a goal, like, you know, suppose you're, an obedient AI, you're, the, a human asks you to achieve a goal, well, you have to reason about how to, like, what intermediate steps you're going to take. Uh, you need to be able to sort of plan out sub-goals and then achieve those sub-goals and then go on and achieve this far goal. And it feels like that's, you know, very core to the, to the concept of general intelligence. Uh, and in some sense, you've just got this core ability and we're like, but also please don't apply it to humans. Like, please don't mm. reason about humans instrumentally. Please don't make sub-goals that involve persuading me or manipulating me. And I, I think Eliezer is totally right that, you know, as you scale this ability up, then it becomes increasingly unnatural to have the sort of exception for humans in, in the instrumental reasoning that the system is doing. You've got this pressure towards, you know, doing instrumental reasoning towards achieving outcomes and... Which, like, in some sense, what alignment is trying to do is carve out this special zone for human values, which says, no, 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 uh, like, don't do the intelligence thing at us in, hmm. in that way. I'd, I'd also flag an, another sort of core idea here is the idea of um, abstraction, the idea that, you know, intelligence is very closely linked to being able to sort of zoom out and see a higher level pattern. Hmm. And again, that's uh, something that when we want to build bounded agents we want to try and avoid we want to say uh you know we've given you a small scale goal or like we've trained you to achieve a small gap scale goal please do not abstract from that into wanting to achieve a much larger scale goal and again we're trying to carve out an exception because most of the time we want our agents to do a lot of abstraction we want them to be thinking in like very creative uh, flexible ways about how the world works it's just that in the particular case of the goals we give them we don't want them to generalize in that way. Okay. So I, I think I think that's kind of like my summary of some of these ideas that I've gotten from Eliezer at least, where he 
he uh, has this concept that, you know, in the limit, once you push towards the heights of great, greater general intelligence, it becomes incredibly hard to prevent these capabilities from being directed at us in the ways that we don't want. It feels like maybe the core disagreement I had is something like, how tight is this abstraction in the sense of how much can we trust that uh, these things are correlated with each other as not just in the regime of like highly super intelligent systems, but also mm. in the regime of systems that, you know, are slightly better than humans or like even noticeably significantly better than humans at doing a wide range of tasks like intellectual research, like jobs in the world, like doing alignment research, things like that. And I guess my position is is just, you know, either I don't understand why he thinks that his claims about the limit of intelligence are also going to continue continue to apply for the relevant period as we approach, um, as we move towards that point, or else maybe he's trusting too much in the abstraction and failing to see ways in which reality might sort of be messier than he thinks is going to be the case. Okay, so so am, am I right to summarize that as you thinking that, like, indeed, in there's some sort of limit where in order to be kind of generally competent, in order to have, like, like if you have the things that we call intelligence, then you sort of think about humans, you're, you're, it's very hard for you to not think about humans instrumentally and, like, abstract your goals to, you know, to larger scales and whatever. But, like, maybe near human level, we can still do it and it'll be fine. That's right. And we might hope that, in particular, um, one argument that feels pretty crucial to me is this idea that humans are, in fact, uh, let's say our comparative advantage is towards a whole bunch of things that are not particularly, let's say, aligned from the perspective of other species. So we, we have a strong advantage at doing things like expanding to new areas, like gathering resources, uh, like hunting and fighting and so on, where not very specialized at things like doing mathematical research, reasoning about um, alignment, uh, reasoning about how to, uh, you know, uh, reasoning about economics, for example, in ways that make our societies better. And so, uh, and that, that's just because of, you know, the environment in which we evolved. Uh, and so it seems very plausible to me that as we train AIs, to become increasingly general and inte generally intelligent, you know, eventually they're going to surpass humans at all of these things. But uh, the hope would be that they surpass humans at the types of things that are most useful and least worrying mm. uh, before they surpass humans at the types of things that uh, th at the sort of like power seeking behavior that we're most worried about. So I guess, it, yeah, a question of like differing comparative advantages, even though, you know, eventually once they get sufficiently intelligent, uh, they'll outstrip us at all of these things. Yeah, so so one concept that I think is lying in the background here is this idea of a pivotal act. Mm -hmm. So so a listener might listen to that and think like, well, it sounds like uh, you're saying that, um, you know, for a while we'll have slightly super intelligent AI mm -hmm. and that'll be fine. But then when we get the really super intelligent AI, that will kill us. And mm -hmm. why should I feel comforted by that? Yeah. Um, so some people have this idea that like, look, when we get really smart AI, step one is to use it to do something that means that we don't have to worry about uh, risk from artificial general intelligence anymore. Mm. And people tend to describe kind of drastic things. To give listeners a sense, I think in this uh, conversation with Yudkowsky, Yudkowsky gave the example of melting every GPU on Earth. Mm. I'm wondering, yeah, how much do you buy the idea of kind of uh, a pivotal act being necessary? And do you think that um, being intelligent enough in the way that you can do some kind of pivotal act is compatible with like the kinds of intelligence where you're coherent enough to, you know, achieve things of value, but you know, you forgot to treat humans as, uh, mm -hmm. you know, instrumental things to be manipulated in service of your goals. So I think that there are certainly, you know, I, I don't think we have particularly strong candidates right now for ways in which you can use an AGI to, prevent scaling up to dangerous regimes. I, th I think there are um, plausible th things that seem worth exploring that are maybe a little bit less uh, dramatic sounding than Eliezer's example. So in the realm of 
alignment research, you might have a system that can make technical progress on, you know, mathematical questions uh, of the sort that um, that are related to AI uh, alignment research. Uh, you could have systems. So that that's kind of yeah. Or, or what one option is like automating the the kind of like theoretical alignment research. Another option, which is associated with proposals like amplification and reward modeling and debate, is just to use these systems to automate the empirical practical side of alignment research uh, by giving better feedback. And then on the governance side, I think just having a bunch of highly capable AIs um, in the world is going to prompt governments to take uh, risks from AGI a lot more seriously. Hmm. And I don't think that the types of action that would be needed to slow down scaling towards dangerous regimes are actually that discontinuous from the types of things we see in the world today. So, you know, for example, global monitoring of uranium uh, and, and uranium enrichment uh, to prevent proliferation of nuclear weapons, I think. Uh, indeed, there's like a lot of cultural pressure against things like building nuclear power um, and a wide range of uh, other um, techn technological progress that's that's seen as dangerous. So I feel uncertain about how like difficult or extreme governance interventions uh, would need to be in order to actually get the world to think, hey, let's slow down a bit. Let's be like much more careful. But to me, it still feels plausible that pivotal action is a little bit of a misnomer. It's more just like the world handling the problem as the world becomes more sort of wakes up to the, the scale and scope of the problem. Okay. And so, and so it seems like in your way of thinking, the thing that uh, stops the slide to, you know, you know, incredibly powerful, uh, unfriendly AGI is we, we get a AGIs to help do our AI safety research for us. Is that about right? Uh, as well as a bunch of governance actions. Right. Um, yeah, so that, that feels like, you know, the sort of, default proposal that I'm excited about but you know like in in, ter in terms of like the specifics of the proposals it's it's you know I, I can't point to any particular thing and say you know th this one is uh one that I think would like work right now sure I sure guess, sure you know. I, I guess if I think about that it seems that um like if I imagine effective safety research mm -hmm. it seems to involve both like pretty good means ends reasoning like you have to reason about the systems that we're going to deploy and what they're going to do and maybe they're going to get roped into helping with the safety research so you have to think about how they'll research or have some invariance about that that are going to be maintained or something so you have to have pretty good means ends reasoning and you also have to be thinking about uh humanity in order to know what counts as safety research versus like you know research to ensure that the agi is blue or some other random property that nobody cares about. And I think there's some worry that like, look, as long as you have that amount of like goal orientation in order to like get you doing like really good research and like that amount of awareness of humans, there's, I think there's some worry that like that combination of attributes is itself enough to, you know, think about humans instrumentally in the kind of dangerous way. Uh, I'm wondering what you think about that. So I, I agree that's an argument as to why we can't just take a system, say, go off, please solve the alignment problem, and then have it just come back to us and, and give us a solution. So I think, yeah, in some sense, uh, many of the alignment proposals that are on the table today mm. are ways of trying to mitigate the things you're discussing. And I don't think that, yeah, it, it, it's, it's hard to say like how much of a disagreement there is here, because you know, I, I do think you know, all of the things you said are just uh, reasons to be worried. But then it feels like I think I think this partly ties back to the thing I was saying before about like the core problem being that we just don't understand the way that these systems are developed. It's so it's less like you have to do a highly specific thing with your system in order to um, make it go well, and more like you just need to have more of a like either you need to like have a deeper understanding, which is kind of like a bit more like intellectual work than going out and doing stuff in the world hmm. um, or maybe you need to just like scale up certain kinds of supervision which 
again, like, I don't currently see the reasons why uh, this is necessarily infeasible. It feels like uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of scope here for promising proposals. Okay. So, yeah, l- let's move on to this thing we've mentioned a couple of times now uh, called alignment. Uh, what First of all, what do you mean by alignment or misaligned AI systems? To a first approximation, when I say aligned, I mean obedient. So okay. uh, a system that when you give it an instruction, it'll follow the intention of that instruction and then come back and uh, and like wait for more instruction. That's kind of like roughly what I mean. And then when I mean misaligned, roughly what I mean is power seeking, a system that is trying to gain power over the world for itself, either um, in order to achieve some other goal that um, you know humanity uh, wouldn't want, or just for the sake of you know, in the same way that some humans are sort of intrinsically power seeking, you might have an AI that's intrinsically power seeking. So yeah, th- th- that's those are the two sort of uh, more specific concepts I usually think about. Okay, how big a role does you know solving the technical problem of making AIs that are aligned? Uh, do you think that that has like a massive role in making our AGIs safe? A minor role? Um, like, do you think it's basically the whole problem or, like, 10% of the problem or something? Um, like, is the question something like, what proportion of the difficulty is alignment versus governance work? Yeah, or just any... I think people... There are some people who think that, like, oh, you'll need to do alignment and also some other stuff. Uh, I don't know if it's governance. I don't know if it's, like, you know, governance of thinking about how the AIs are going to interact and maybe some people really want them to coordinate. You know, there might be a variety of things there. Yeah, so I guess I feel like it's most of the problem, but nowhere near all of it. Like, if I think about the ways in which I'm concerned about existential risk from advanced AI, probably the split is something like 50% worried about alignment, 25% worried about sort of governance failures related to alignment, and then... 25% 25% worried about just straightforward misuse or, you know, conflicts that are sparked by um, major technological change. Okay. So a concern that I think some people have with the idea of AI alignment is this fear that, like, oh, we're going we're gonna to create this ability for these really powerful people to create AI systems uh, mm. that, that just do what they want, that are, that are super obedient to them. Mm-hmm. And I think some people have this worry that, like, oh, we've, we've just, like, We've just created this effective machine to turn people into tyrants mm-hmm. um, or you know totalitarian overlords. How worried are you about this? I think that yeah, it seems pretty worrying that advances in technology lead to dramatic increases in inequality, and part like a big part of AI governance uh, should be setting up structures and systems to ensure that uh, these systems, if they're aligned, are, are then used well. So I think uh, there's work on, you know, like Kalanoki, for example, has a paper on windfall clauses, which uh, talks about um, the ways in which uh, you might try and redistribute benefits from AGI uh, more broadly. I think there's uh, various things to do with uh, you know, like not just corporate governance, but also like uh, global governance that like, uh, you know, I, I think there's a bunch of unsolved questions there. Ultimately, it's not clear to me what the alternative to addressing these questions is. I think that, uh, yeah, it, it would it would be nice if we can kind of like mitigate all of these problems at once, but it feels like we're just going to have to like do the hard work of you know set, setting up uh, uh, as many structures and safeguards as we can. Sure. I so I guess some people might think like, look, the alternative is try and think hard until you come up with a plan other than uh, create an AI that's really aligned to an individual, uh, or maybe like you know come up with a technical plan to create an AI that's aligned with humanity or objective moral truth or something. I guess uh, I feel pretty pessimistic about not just having to solve alignment, but also having to solve morality, for example. 
um, it feels like. Uh, I, I'm, I don't think we necessarily want, when I say obedient, it doesn't need to be the case that the system is obedient to a given individual, right? Probably uh, you want to train it so that it's obedient to, ideally speaking, to individuals who have the right, um, you know, certifications, such as being democratically elected or th things like that. Um, and with it, hopefully within certain bounds of like what actions they're not meant to take. So like, you know, in an ideal world, if I could have uh, all the alignment desiderata I wanted, um, it, it, I, I'd set that up uh, in a much better way. But I do think that, you know, this core idea of obedience, uh, it feels valuable to me because, yeah, like uh, the problem of politics is hard. The problem of ethics is hard. Mm. Uh, you know, I don't think uh, it's... If you can solve the problem of, a, of making a system obedient, then we can kind of like try and leverage all the existing solutions we have to uh, governance, things like, uh, you know, like all, all the systems and structures that have been built up over time uh, to try and figure out how we're going to deploy these advanced technologies. I, I don't want people to try and like have to reason these things through from first principles uh, while they're trying to um, build aligned AGIs. Okay. I guess another thing that you mentioned in AGI safety from first principles is transparency is this important um, part of a AGI alignment. Um, so could you first say perhaps briefly like what role you see transparency research is playing? I can speak I, I'll speak differently for like the the wider field and then for myself. So I think in the wider field it, it's playing a pretty crucial role right now in terms of transparency is in some sense one of the core underlying drivers of many proposals for alignment. I'd say the, the other core driver here is just using more human data, just like trying to uh, get more feedback from uh, humans um, so that we can use that to nudge systems towards fulfilling human preferences better. So yeah, uh, a, lot of, a lot of research agendas are kind of assuming a certain amount of uh, interpretability or transpar transparency. I'm using those interchangeably. Um, for my own part, you know, I defer to other people, uh, to some extent on how much progress we're going to make, because it does seem like there's been pretty impressive progress so far. I feel a little confused about how we could, how work on interpretability could possibly scale up as fast as we're scaling up, uh, the most sophisticated models. When I think about trying to understand the human brain to a level that's required, to figure out if a thought that a human is having is like good or bad. That seems very hard. People have been working at it for a very long time. And now, of course, there are a bunch of big advantages that we have when we do interpretability research on neural networks, like we have full read-write access to the neurons, but we also have a bunch of disadvantages as well, like the architecture changes every couple of years, so you have to switch to a new system that might be built quite differently, and you don't have you know introspective access or necessarily very much cooperation from the system as you're trying to figure out what's going on inside it. Sure. So, you know, on balance, I feel personally kind of pessimistic, but at the same time, uh, it seems like something that we should try and make as much progress on it as we can. It feels like very robustly good to just know what's going on within our systems. Yeah. So, so if you're pessimistic, um, do, do you think we can do without it? Or do you think we'll need it, but it's just very hard and it's unlikely we'll get it? I guess it feels like so i have a pretty broad range of credences over how hard the alignment problem might be um you know there's a reasonable range in which interpretability is just necessary or, or something equivalently powerful is necessary you know there's mm. also s ranges in which it isn't and i think i focus a bit more on the ranges of difficulty in which it's not necessary just because those feel like the most tractable sure uh, places uh, to pay attention, so I don't. I don't really have a strong estimate of how um, you know the ratio between those. Let's say. Okay, sure. And another thing, I guess to talk about is this idea of AI cooperation. Um, so mm. I've, uh, I, I guess Vincent Conitzer has actually recently started a seminar series on this. Mm. You hear people having this sense of like, oh look, I, I, yeah, I believe Andrew Critch uh, wrote a thing basically arguing that, look, even if you solve AI alignment, you're going to have you know, a whole bunch of AI systems and 
solving the problem of making sure that that interaction doesn't generate externalities, which you know are dangerous to humans or something, is even harder than solving the alignment problem. Hey, a quick note from future Daniel. To the best of my knowledge, there is no written piece where Andrew Critch makes this argument. He has said via personal communication that he prefers to not debate which problem is harder, but that he would like people working on both. So I'm wondering, yeah, what, what do you think about the worry about yeah, making sure that AIs coordinate well? I guess it feels like mainly the type of thing that we can outsource to AIs once they're sufficiently capable. You know, I don't see a particularly strong reason to think that systems that are comparably powerful as humans or like more powerful than humans are going to make obvious mistakes in how they coordinate. Yeah, so I think, again, it's kind of like, you know, you have this framing of like AI coordination. Like we could also just say uh, politics, right? Like we think that geopolitics is going to be hard. Yep. in a world where AIs exist. And when you have that framing, you're like, you know, geopolitics is hard, but it's also, you know, we've made a bunch of progress compared with, you know, a few hundred years ago where there were many more wars. Um, it feels pretty plausible that a bunch of trends that have led to less conflict are just going to continue. And so I still haven't seen arguments that make me feel like, this particular problem is like incredibly difficult as opposed to, you know, arguments which I have seen for why the alignment problem is plausibly incredibly difficult. All right. All right. So I guess I'd like to get back to a thing we talked about a bit earlier, which is this question about um, how much we should think about the optima of various reward functions or like the limit of intelligence or something. Mm -hmm where I, I see you as thinking that people focus perhaps too much on that and that we should really be thinking about selection pressures during training. I'm wondering, like, what mistakes do you think people make when they are thinking about in this framework of Optima? Yeah, so I think the there are kind of two opposing mistakes that I think different groups of people are making. So uh, Eliezer and Murray, more generally, it really does feel like they're thinking about systems that are so idealized that they aren't very uh the, the the applicability of insights about them to uh systems to the first agis we build or the, the ones that are a little bit better than humans at making intellectual progress you hmm. know is pretty limited and you know there are a bunch of examples of this i think uh like ai xi is a kind of dubious it's kind of like one of the metaphors i use sometimes is it's like trying to design a train by thinking about what happens when a train approaches the speed of light hmm. um you know it's just not that helpful uh so that's that's like one class of mistakes that i'm worried about and like to do with also related to the idea that uh things that you can just extrapolate this idea of intelligence until it's to the infinite limit like there is such a thing as perfect rationality for example or like you know the limit of approaching perf uh, perfect rationality makes sense. Hmm. So that's one mistake I'm kind of worried about. I think on the other hand, it feels like a bunch of uh, more machine learning focused alignment researchers don't take this idea of optimization pressure seriously enough. And so it feels like there's a few different strands of research that that just reroute the optimization pressure or like block it from flowing through the most obvious route, but then uh, just like leave other ways for it to to cause the same problems. Um, probably the most obvious example of this to me is the concept of myopia, which um, mm. especially Evan Hubinger is pretty keen on it and a, f a few other researchers as well. And to me, it seems like you can't have it both ways. If you've got a system that is highly competent, then there must have been you know some sort of pressure uh, towards it achieving things on uh, long time frames. Yeah. Uh, and then that's like exactly, e even if it's like nominally myopic or like I, I haven't seen any particular insight as to how you can have that pressure applying without making the agent actually care about or pursue goals over long time horizons. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, the same thing is true uh, uh, with cooperative in 
inverse reinforcement learning, like where it feels to me like it just kind of reroutes the uh, pressure towards the sort of instrumental reasoning in a slightly different way, but it doesn't actually help in uh, preventing that pressure from pushing towards um, misaligned goals. So, yeah, so I, I think um, the, the key thing that I would like to see from these types of research agendas, and to some extent also stuff from ARC, like imitative generalization and eliciting latent knowledge, is just like a statement of what the core insight is, or what the core reason why uh, this isn't just reframing the problem. Uh, or like w which part is actually doing the work of preventing the optimization pressure towards bad outcomes. Because uh, I feel pretty uncertain about that for a lot of existing research agendas. Yeah. But let's talk about cooperative inverse reinforcement learning, actually, which is a subject I'm like mm -hmm. relatively more familiar with. So I think like the idea, uh, as I understand it, is something like, look, we're going to think about human AI interaction as, you know, the human has a goal. And like the human AI system, you know, somehow has to optimize for that goal. And so the alignment is sort of coming from it being instrumentally valuable for the AI system to figure out what the human goal is and then optimize for it. And so you get alignment because the AI is doing what you want in that way. I'm wondering, like, where do you think this is missing the idea of optimization pressure? So the, the way that Stuart Russell often explains his ideas is that the key component is making an AI that's uncertain about human preferences. Yep. But the problem here is that like, the, the thing that we really want to do is just point the AI at human preferences at all. Like, make it so that it is, in fact, optimized in the direction of fulfilling human preferences. And mm. like, whether or not it actually has uncertainty about those things, uh, about what humans care about, it is kind of just like this intermediate like problem where the, the fundamental problem is like what signal are we giving it that points it towards human preferences or like what are we changing compared with a, a sort of straightforward setup where we just like give it rewards for um, doing well and uh, penalize it for doing badly. And one thing you might say is, is like, look, the thing we're changing is that we have the model of um, human rationality. Like we have some assumptions about like how the human is choosing uh, their actions yeah. and that could be the thing that's doing the work but like i haven't seen any model that's like actually is making enough progress on this that it it's plausible that that's doing the hard the heavy lifting if you will like most of the models of human rationality i've seen are very simple ones of like noisily rational or things like that and so if that model isn't doing the work hmm. uh then what actually changes in the context of cell that points the AI towards human preferences any better than a straightforward, you know, reward learning setup. And that that's the thing I'm, I feel, I, I don't think exists. Okay, cool. So I, I guess on the other side of it, in terms of people who focus on like optimality more than you might, in my imagination, there's this reasoning that goes something like, look, when I think about like super optimal things that AI systems could do uh, in order to achieve some goal or something, as long as I can think of something, of some property of an optimal system, you know, it would be really surprising if, like, the AI system, whatever AI system that we train to do some goal, uh, even if it's, like, as competent as I am, if it can't think of that thing. And therefore, like, any thoughts I can generate about, like, properties of optimal AI systems, there's going to be some selection pressure for that just because, like, in order to get something that's more competent than me at achieving goals, it'll have like this a similar sort of reasoning ability as me. I'm wondering, uh, do you disagree with that, first of all? And if you do disagree with that, why? And if you don't, maybe can you generate a stronger statement that you hear that you disagree with? So suppose we're thinking about the first system that is better than humans at reasoning about optimality processes and how they relate to AI alignment. It seems like our key goal should be uh, making sure that system is uh, using its knowledge in ways that are beneficial to us. So, you know, maybe telling us about it or maybe using that knowledge to design a more aligned successor or something like that. But that system itself, like, it's, it seems very unclear the extent to which that system, we can reason about that system via talking about optimality constraints. Yeah, so it's, it's really, it's really it, it feels like my thinking here is about handing over to 
AI systems that are aligned enough that they can like do the heavy lifting in the future. And I, I don't think it's like necessarily a bad strategy to focus on just like solving the whole problem in one go. But I do think that going about it via thinking in like precise technical terms about the sort of limit of intelligence seems a little bit off. Um, so I guess there's this thought that's like, look, anything, well, like maybe I can think of some strategy, something in the limit of intelligence might take or some, you know, some idea that like, oh, well, if you were really smart, you would, um, try to like, you know, treat humans instrumentally or something. And I, and I think there's some concern that like, look, if I can think of that, then sort of definitionally, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, I guess maybe not quite definitionally, but almost definitionally something smarter than me can think of it. And so it, it seems like there's some instinct that says like, look, once you have systems that are like smarter than me, if they, you know, it, if, if these sort of ideas actually like help it achieve goals or, you know, help it, you know, do whatever it's being selected to do, then that should happen. Do you agree with that argument? Do you think that it's like, doesn't get you the kind of, reasoning you regard as worrisome or well it seems like the key question is whether those systems will in fact want to you know achieve goals that we're unhappy about okay um you know like as as one uh yeah and it, it feels like the, the ways in which their motivations are shaped like whether that system will decide to do things that are bad for humans or not is going to be the type of thing that's kind of shaped in a pretty messy way by a bunch of uh, gradient descent on a bunch of like data points okay. in, in kind of the same way that you know i am a human i'm reasoning about you know very intelligent future systems and trying to figure out which ones to instantiate but like the way in which i'm choosing which ones to instantiate is very dependent on these sort of like gut emotional instincts that were kind of like honed over you know long period of evolution and like childhood and so on and you, the, those emotions and instincts are things that feel very hard to reason about in precise in a precise technical manner okay so the idea is that like uh sure an ai system can you know maybe it can figure out various strategies anything yeah. that i can think of yeah but maybe like you know maybe maybe we have reason to think that uh we can have some sort of training process that like maybe in the limit of the training process would produce an ai that wanted to do stuff that the thing it's supposed to be aligned to disapproves of yep. but actually it's just it's just like very unlikely to come up with an ai that has those sorts of desires and therefore that's right you don't have to worry about this kind of reasoning that's right um e even though if it did have those desires it would do better on the kind of outside objective we just like won't train the overall objective to optimality right and you know that's in some sense the reason that we're not worried about um, dogs wanting to take over the world even though like we've you know done artificial selection on dogs for a while and like in theory at least the signal that we're sending to them as we do artificial selection incentivizes them to take over the world mm. uh, in some sort of you know uh, kind of stylized abstract way but in practice uh, that's not the direction that their motivations are being pushed towards and you know we might hope that the same is true of systems even if they're a bit more intelligent or like significantly more intelligent than humans uh, they're just the extreme uh, optima of whatever reward function we're using are just not that relevant or salient. Okay. So moving on a bit, you had this conversation um, with Elias Yudkowsky, you know, try, trying to get to the, I guess, trying to really formalize your disagreements, mm -hmm. it seems to me like. I'm wondering if any of that conversation changed your mind and if you can say how it did. I think... Yeah, the two biggest things that I took away were, number one, as I tried to explain my views about AI governance to Eliezer, I realized that they were just missing a whole bunch of detail and nuance. Um, and so any optimism that I have about AI governance needs to be grounded in, you know, much more specific details and plans for what might happen and so on. And that's uh, led to a bunch of recent work. Um, that I'm doing on, you know, formulating a bit more of a governance research agenda and like figuring out what the uh, crucial considerations here are. Um, so that was one thing that changed my mind, but that was a bit more about just like me trying to flesh out my own views. Sure. I think in terms of Eliezer's views, I think that I had previously underestimated how much his position relied on a few sort of very deep, 
abstractions uh, that kind of like all fitted together around like I don't think you can really separate his views on like intelligence, his views on consequentialism or agency, his uh, his views on um, recursive self improvement, things like that. Like you, you you can kind of like look at different parts of it, but it seems like there's this yeah this this underlying deep rooted set of intuitions that like he keeps trying to explain in ways that people like pick up on uh, the particular thing he's trying to explain, but not not the uh, without. Uh, sort of having a good handle on the overall set of intuition. So like one particularly salient example of this is that he keeps talking about uh, utility functions or he, like previously he talked a lot about utility functions and then myself and Rohan Shah and a bunch of other people like tried quite hard to figure out, you know, what like what specific argument he was making around mm. uh, utility functions. And we basically f- failed because because utility functions for him, uh, it feels like, in some sense, they're almost like, I, I, do, I don't think that there's a specific, precise technical argument that you can make with our current understanding of utility theory uh, mm. that um, that tells us about um, AGIs. I think it's much more like, so you don't have a, a specific argument about utility functions uh, and their relationship to AGIs in a precise technical way. Instead, it's more like, utility functions are like a pointer towards the type of later theory that will be a much more precise uh, that will give us a much more precise understanding of uh, of how to think about intelligence and uh, agency and AGI's pursuing goals and so on and to Eliezer it seems like we've got a bunch of uh, different handles on what the shape of this larger scale theory might look like um, but he can't really explain it in like precise terms in like uh you know maybe the same way that uh for any other scientific theory uh before you kind of like latch onto it you can't uh you you can only like gesture towards a bunch of different intuitions that you have about and, and be like hey guys like there are these links between them that you know i can't make precise or rigorous or formal at this point Okay, sort of related to updates. If there is one belief about existential risk from AI that you could create greater consensus about among the sort of the population of people who are professional AI research who thought you know carefully about existential risk from AI for maybe more than ten hours, what belief would it be? Probably the main answer is just the the thing I was saying before about how, you know, we want to be clear about where the work is being done in a specific um, alignment proposal. Uh, And like, it seems important to think about Mm. having, having something that doesn't just shuffle the optimization pressure around, but like really uh, like gives us some deeper reason to think that the problem is being solved where, you know, uh, one example is that in uh, when it comes to Paul Cristiano's work on amplification, I think uh, one sort of core insight that's doing a lot of the work is that imitation is uh, can be very powerful without being equivalently dangerous. So yeah, this this idea that you know instead of optimizing for a target, you can just optimize to be similar to humans, and that might still get you a very long way. And then you know an- another related insight that makes amplification promising is the idea that uh is the idea that decomposing tasks uh can sort of like leverage human abilities in a, in a powerful way um now I, I don't think that those are anywhere near sort of like complete uh ways of addressing the problem but they sort of gesture like this is where the work is being done whereas like you know for some other proposals i i, I don't think there's an equivalent story about like what's the um deeper uh idea or principle that's like allowing the work to be done to solve this like difficult problem. Maybe, maybe a second thing is that uh, I personally, like in my recent, more recent work about the alignment problem, I've been moving a little bit away from uh, the term Mesa optimizers or like talking about the distinction between the, um, a clean distinction between the outer alignment problem and the inner alignment problem. Yeah, I, I, I think that 
you know, it was like an incredibly important idea when it first came out because it kind of like helped us clarify a bunch of confused intuitions about, uh, you know, the relationship between reward functions and goals for intelligent mm. systems, for example. But I think at this point, uh, we might be at a point where we want to be thinking about, you know, uh, what's the spectrum between a system that's like purely guided by a reward function versus a system like a policy that has been trained on a reward function now like makes no reference to the uh, reward function at all. I think, uh, you know, these are, these are two extremes and like in practice, it seems unlikely that we're going to end up at either extreme because reward functions are just like very useful. So, so yeah, we, we should, we should try and be thinking about what, what's going on in the middle here and like sort of shaping our arguments accordingly. Another way of thinking about that is, is kind of like, you know, which is the correct analogy for uh, reinforcement learning agents? Is it the case that uh, gradient descent is like evolution? Uh, or is it the case that gradient descent is like, you know, learning in the human brain? And the answer is like kind of a little mm. bit of both. Like kind of uh, it's it's going to play a role that's like intermediate between these two things or like has properties of both of these. And we shouldn't kind of uh, treat these as two separate possibilities, but rather as like two gestures towards like what we should expect the future of AI to look like. Okay. I guess a sort of related question. I, I think by now the there's some community of people who are like, you know, really, yeah, really, really think that AGI poses an existential risk and that it's really mm -hmm. dangerous and they're doing research about it and there's some, you know, intellectual edifice there. What do you think the strongest criticisms of that intellectual edifice around the idea of AGI existential risk are that deserve more engagement from the community of researchers thinking about it? I think the strongest criticisms used to be insufficient engagement with machine learning and this has mostly been addressed these days i think plausibly another criticism um just like we as a movement uh probably haven't been as clear as we could be in communicating about risks yeah so it's probably this is like a slightly boring answer but like you mm. know I, I think there's uh there aren't that many explanations for example like of the ai alignment problem that are like short accessible like aimed at people who have you know uh competence with uh machine learning and compelling like i think when, when you point people to like super intelligence well it doesn't engage with machine learning when you point people to uh something like human compatible it actually like doesn't spend very much time on like the reasons why we expect risks to arise okay. uh so i think that th there's some type of intellectual work here that just uh you know was kind of nobody's job for a while hmm. um i think that uh you know agi safety uh from first principles kind of like was aimed at filling this gap and then also more recent work by uh for example joe cowsmith um from open philanthropy uh with a report called is power seeking ai an existential risk or something like that hmm. um but i still think that there's a bit of a gap there and i think it, it's like a gap that's profitable not just for uh not just in terms of like reaching out to other communities uh but also just for having a better understanding of the problem that will make our own research go better i think that um a lot of disagreements that kind of initially seem like disagreements about which research is promising are actually uh, more like disagreements about uh, what the problem actually is in the first place. Hmm. Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of a, like my sort of standard answer. Yeah, and, and I guess sort of converse, sort of like converse of that question. Um, you've worked at uh, a few different AI research organizations mm -hmm. with a bunch of people who are, um, you know, working on just making AI more capable and um, better you know, reasoning and pattern matching and such, um, but not particularly not working on safety in terms of preventing existential risks. Why don't you think that, they're, that they have that focus? It varies a bunch by person. I'd say a bunch of people are just less focused on AGI and more focused on sort of, uh, you know, uh, pushing the field 
forward in a sort of reasonably straightforward incremental way. Um, a bunch of people are, I think there's a, there's a type of like emotional orientation towards taking potentially very impactful arguments very seriously. And I think that a lot of people are quite cautious about those arguments. And, you know, to some extent, rightfully so, because uh, it's very easy to be fooled by arguments that are kind of very high level and abstract. Hmm. Um, so it's almost like there's this habit or there's this predilection towards thinking, man, this is really big if true, and then like wanting to dig into it. Uh, and I think uh, my guess is that that's probably the main thing blocking people from taking these ideas more seriously is just not getting that instinctive like oh wow like this is kind of crazy uh reaction uh but like crazy enough that i should actually try very hard to figure it out for myself yeah so i think uh in his most important century series of blog posts holden karnofsky does a really good job at kind of like addressing this intuition just being like uh, this does sound crazy, and but here are, here are like a bunch of like outside view reasons to think that you should engage with the craziness. Here are a bunch of um, you know specific arguments uh, on the object level, and here's kind of like a sort of emotional attitude that I take towards the um, towards the problem. And yeah, that, that that feels like the that feels like it's pretty directly aimed at uh, the types of things that a lot of machine learning researchers are like that's determining their beliefs. Sure. So moving on, if somebody's listening to this podcast, they're like, ah, I, you know, Richard Ngo uh, seems like a productive researcher somehow. And they want to know like, what, what, what's it like to be you doing research? Uh, what, what's your, perhaps you could say your production function. Right. I've been thinking a little bit about this lately because uh, we're also hiring for the, the team I'm uh, leading at OpenAI. And, uh, you know, what what are the traits that I'm really excited about in a researcher? And I think it's the combination of, like, engaging with high-level abstractions in a comfortable way while also being very cautious about ways that those abstractions might break down. And, or, or like, you know, miss the mark. So I, I guess it, to, to me, it kind of feels like a lot of what I'm doing with my research, I, I use the metaphor um, of bungee jumping recently, which is like going mm. as high as you can in terms of abstraction space and then like, uh, you know, jumping down to try and like uh, get in touch with the ground again and then like bounce, uh, like trying to carry that uh, like ground level observation as far back up as you can. Hmm. Um, so that's the sort of, feeling that I have when I'm doing a lot of this conceptual research in particular. And then, yeah, my personal style um, is, 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 yeah, like very start very top down and then like be, be like very careful to try and fill in enough details that things feel um, very grounded and, and credible. Um, was that like roughly the thing you were aiming towards? Or yeah. That... Seems roughly like an answer. And I guess the second to last question I'd like to ask well, it might be the second to last. Uh, is there anything else that I should have asked you? And if so, what? I feel like there's something important to do with what the world looks like as we approach AGI. Um, it feels like there's a lot of work being done by, by you know, either assumptions that, oh, the world will look very either the world will look kind of roughly the same as it does now except that these labs will be producing this incredibly powerful technology or else uh the idea that the world will you know be radically transformed by like new applications like floating around everywhere and I, some some of this has already been covered before May, maybe the thing that i'm really interested in right now is how do people respond to like what what are the types of warning signs that actually make people sit up and pay attention as opposed to the types of warning signs that people just kind of dismiss with a bit of a shrug mm. and you know i think uh covid has been a particularly interesting case study where 
Um, you can imagine uh, some worlds in which, you know, COVID is just like a very big warning sign that makes everyone pay attention to the risks of, you know, engineered pandemics. Or you can imagine a world in which people kind of collectively shrug and are like, okay, that was bad. And then like, don't really think so much about like what might happen next. And, you know, it's not totally clear to me which world we're going to end up in, but uh, it feels like uh, we should be thinking or somebody should be thinking hard about like, what are the levers that steer us towards this world or the other world? And then in the analogous case of AI, what are the levers that steer us, you know, from a given, like, very impressive large-scale application of AI towards, um, you know, different possible narratives and different possible responses? And that's something that I'm thinking about a bit more in, in my work today. It feels like a under-addressed question. Okay. Yeah, well, I guess the final thing I'd like to ask is if somebody's listened to this interview and uh, they want to know more about you, they maybe want to follow your research, how should they do so? So the easiest way to follow my research is on the Alignment Forum, where I uh, post most of the sort of informal stuff that I've been working on. Another, another way you could follow my thinking in a sort of higher bandwidth way is uh, just via Twitter where I share, you know, work that I'm releasing as well as, uh, as as well as just like more miscellaneous thoughts. And you can find both of them by looking just my name, Richard Ngo. And then probably the, the other thing that I want to flag is the course that I've designed and which is currently running, which is the AGI Safety Fundamentals course. And this is my attempt to make the core ideas in AI alignment uh, as accessible as possible and, uh, you know, d uh, have a curriculum people can work through and, and really grapple with the core issues. Uh, and uh, it's run as a um, as a facilitated discussion group. So you sort of go along uh, every week for a couple of months and uh, have discussions with a, a small group of people. Um, yeah, and, and we've been running that. This is the third cohort of people that we're running now, and we'll probably open up applications for another one in six months or so. So that's something to keep an eye on. Or even if you don't want to do the uh, course itself, you can just have a look at the curriculum, which is, uh, which is I think, a pretty good reading list for learning more about the field. We've also got a parallel program uh, on... Uh, we've got two tracks. One is technical alignment. The other one is AI governance, and we've got curricula for both of those. So that's, if you want to learn more, you can check those out, um, which we've like pretty carefully curated to convey the core ideas in the field. Great. Well, uh, links to all of those will be in the show notes. So thanks for joining me today. And to the listeners, I hope you got something out of this conversation. Absolutely. Thanks a bunch, Daniel. This episode is edited by Jack Garrett, and Justice Mills helped with the transcription. The opening and closing themes are by Jack Garrett. The financial costs of making this episode are covered by a grant from the Long-Term Future Fund. To read a transcript of this episode, or to learn how to support the podcast, you can visit axerp.net. Finally, if you have any feedback about this podcast, you can email me at feedback at axerp.net. <laughs>